So they were gonna explore this mysterious looking lava lamp. Oh, it's not a lava lamp, it's a simulation called 3D Cellular Automata. It's pronounced Automata. Oh. 3D Cellular Automata. Die. One day Sack on Discord sent me this video and seeing these weird patterns emerge in 3D was so intriguing that I decided I'm gonna make my own 3D cellar automata simulation. Let's be productive, let's close down Factorio, dual boot into Linux and start a new project. I use Arch by the way, I'm kidding I'm not but it's just fun to see. I'm of course going to use the Rust programming language and a game engine called Bevy. What are we actually building? How does it work? What is it? What? So I bet some of you have seen Conway's Game of Life. It's a 2D grid where cells can disappear or spawn based on how many neighbors a cell has. What we're building is very similar to that but at the same time also different in many ways. The focus in Game of Life is to design the structures and watch it play out based on the established rules. In 3D Cellular Automata, the goal is more about tweaking these rules. So, in 3D Cellular Automata, we have four rules. Tweaking just one part can yield very different behaviors, so let's break it down. Take the rule 445M. We get this behavior, where we got a lot of small moving parts. This is what the rules mean. Let's start with the first setting, Survival 4. So we have a cell right here. For this cell to survive over the next simulation tick, we need to have, according to our rules, four neighbors. In this setup, it wouldn't survive because it has only two neighbors. It would neither survive if it had five neighbors. We need, according to the rule, four neighbors for this cell to survive. That is the survival rule. Let's take a look on the next one, which is birth. Cells can also spawn, and we're using the same method, counting neighbors, to decide if something should spawn. Take this empty cell right here. If it has, according to our birth rule, four neighbors, it will come alive. With just one neighbor, this cell would stay empty. It's as simple as that. The first two rules states how many neighbors do we need for a cell to survive or for a cell to spawn. Let's get into the third one, which is a little bit more tricky. Let's say this cell only has three neighbors. It would not survive to the next round according to our current rule. They don't actually disappear immediately. They have a hidden state value. If we move one game tick forward, this particular cell would go from state five down to state four. The third rule tells us how many states a cell has. So the next game take rolls around, and let's say this cell luckily happened to get four neighbors. Does that mean it will now survive? No. When a cell starts dying, the inner state will keep ticking down until it reaches zero, and then it gets removed. The last rule decides how we sample the neighbors. Using the method called more, which I accidentally called moose in my code because I forgot what it was called. Don't judge me, it's more fun to say moose. In the more method, anything one cell away counts as a neighbor, even the cells on the edge like this. That's the moose version, I mean more version. Another neighbor counting method is 3D von Neumann, which only counts cells where the face of the cells meet each other like this. The last rule tells us what method are we using for counting the neighbors? Where did all of this terminology come from? I don't know, I'm actually basing everything off this one article. Which you can find in the description of this video, link down below. And here you can also find the like button if you want to help me out a little bit. There's one thing I haven't mentioned yet, and that is, these rules can have any amount of numbers that we want. We don't have to specify birth rule 4, we can say birth rule 4 5, so they will survive if they have 4 or 5 neighbors. That's what these dashes mean and the comma. We can simply have more than one number as a rule. Understanding how our values impact the simulation is really hard. So I've been on an adventure just putting in random numbers hoping it would give me a cool looking simulation. A lot of the time everything just dies off or chances are everything will just expand resulting in a huge blob. It's really hard to find the sweet spot where we have a balanced simulation where things doesn't get out of hand. The only thing I've been able to decode is how these spaceship looking things form in the 445 rule. If we had a cube where the values in front had state 5 and the ones in the back had state 4, looking at the survival rule none of these blocks will survive. They need 4 neighbors to survive and all of these only has 3 neighbors. This one has 1, 2, 3. This one has 1, 2, 3. Looking at the birth rule however, an empty cell needs 4 alive neighbors. This cell has 1, 2, 3, 4 alive neighbors, meaning this empty cell will come alive and same goes for these positions. 
One game tick goes and bam, we got a moving spaceship! Majestic! We can also understand that if the state's value were higher than 5, the tail of the ship would simply be longer. That is the longest explanation I've ever heard. Let's actually build this application. So let's close down this script, boot into Linux, start a new Rust project, import the bevy engine. And now what do we do? Well, we do what any sensible programmer would do and go yoink some code. Bevy example code, shader, shader instancing, copy that thing. Cute, now we can draw cubes. Majestic. The cell values are stored in a hash map. The algorithm- uh, Wait, here goes my viewer attention. Oh no, don't talk about the code. Don't talk about the code. Hold on, hold on. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about the code, but basically, through trial and error, doing detective work on that article, I finally got it to work. In this project, I also went down a huge rabbit hole. Multithreading. Turns out calculating a bunch of data can lag, and my perfectionist programmer mind wants it to be fast. So, time to add multithreading. We need a mutex. I can use a hash map mask to reduce the calculations needed. Oh no, there comes the viewer attention. Don't talk about the code. So yeah, I... I probably spent three days just writing multithreading code. I'm not kidding. Pixel is very slow. No shit, Sherlock. I need more information! Well, let's see if it paid off. I made it pretty fast, I think. Let's compare the single-threaded variant to the new fancy multi-threaded variant. Multi-threaded version is pretty fast. What about the slow single-threaded version? Uh... So my multi-threaded version is actually slower under these specific conditions. Let's increase the bounce of the level. As you can see, now the multi-threaded version is a lot more faster. The performance changes under different conditions. Now my monkey brain really wants to explore this optimization rabbit hole. The bottom line is, I have a simulation that works, I'm making this for a video, it doesn't need to be performant. This is something I'm struggling with as a programmer sometimes. It can be really exciting to see how many different ways you can approach a problem. I would also love to have a menu for this application where you can change the rules live. I need to recompile my software every time I changed the rules up. Implementing these things would take me a few more days and it wouldn't change much about this video to be honest. So here's where I'm gonna stop the development of this project. You can find the code on my github page linked down below. If you got this far into the video, I will award you with a rap. 3D cellular automata It looks like a lava lamp You shut up but with the different rules Make and move This is my boxer's goal And make it faster with the motor threading Than we are the pastas But get the code everywhere But it's optimized so I don't care Subscribe and smash the like The tent has mixed a piece back With a laid back track Okay Okay